people often wonder uh, in Texas why I'm going out talking to groups of teachers, uh, which is something that I do uh, very commonly. And what I want to draw your attention to is no question, uh, but that a lot of the work that I do uh, in research, not all the work, uh, research uh, in my clinical setting and otherwise, is with children that would commonly be called learning disabled. I actually don't believe in the concept of a learning disability. And the big concern that I have uh, as an individual who spends about half their time in research and about half my time in a clinical setting is separating uh, problems that really re reflect what we uh, in our area are now calling intractable reading disability from children who don't learn to read because of instructional uh, types of issues. And I would draw your attention specifically to this yellow sheet uh, here to uh, one of the results of a study that I was part of, if I can find it. Uh, it's down in about the middle of the first page. Uh, children with reading disability differ from one another and from other readers along a continuous distribution. They do not aggregate together to form a distinct hump separate from the normal distribution. Poor reading is poor reading. We actually have very little evidence uh, at this point uh, that lets us separate, for example, children who read poorly according to cause. Uh, we have as much evidence for instructional causes as we do for biological uh, causes. And we absolutely know that all these causes uh, are relevant and that they affect different children. But at this point, uh, we don't have the ability to, to separate these just by definition. So I've probably been doing research on reading disabilities now for about 20 years. Uh, when I first started, we actually did epidemiological studies in Florida. And we found basically a prevalence of reading failure in children in Alachua County, Florida, between 5 and 10 percent. Uh, there were four different epidemiological studies uh, in the 70s uh, that looked at the same issue, and the big controversy at the time was really whether the prevalence was closer to 5% or 10%. Now, the study, I've also been in epidemiological studies in the 90s, and there are two big epidemiological studies at this point, and we're talking prevalence figures of 15 to 20% using similar definitions, same populations uh, of children. Why has that uh, happened? Well, the biggest shift that I've made in my clinical work, uh, what I do in my clinical work is I operate a clinic and I assess children that have uh, different kinds of school problems. It's not called a learning disabilities clinic. It's called a school problems clinic. We take any child uh, who's struggling uh, in school. We don't take children whose problem is primarily in the behavioral area. We're really looking for kids that are having instructional disabilities. And the biggest shift that I've made uh, personally in terms of what I tell parents is to try and distinguish uh, effects on the child that are really a product of curriculum and instruction from a more fundamental persistent disability. And the most important thing that I do at this point is I get kids uh, into instructional situations, where, particularly in the reading area, where I can get about a year of uh, individualized uh, instruction. And I'm only willing to call somebody disabled at this point if they don't profit uh, from this year. And the other reason I think that's really important, I'm going to draw your attention again to this yellow sheet, to the third uh, bullet. And that's the idea that reading disabilities reflect a persistent deficit rather than a developmental lag. Longitudinal studies show that of those children who are reading disabled in the third grade, approximately 74% remain disabled in the ninth grade. If you wait until the third grade to identify problems in reading, you probably already waited too long because they're very difficult to remediate uh, at that uh, age level. So the other emphasis I've made in my research uh, is really uh, on issues that I've really worked on for 20 years, and that's the whole issue of early detection and now with Barbara Foreman, early uh, intervention. And I know that you're going to hear about uh, some of the early intervention work uh, a little bit uh, later. My job today is to talk about assessment. Assessment is something that I do for a living. I'm basically an expert in measurement. Uh, I've, I've been doing measurement work for 20 years. There are lots of different things that I measure. I measure reading. Uh, I know how to give and interpret IQ tests. I don't really think much of them, but I know how to do it. Uh, I measure variables at the level of the brain. I measure environments. I'm a measurement uh, person. So when I was asked to uh, talk about assessment, you know, my immediate thought was that that would be easy because I actually go out and talk for assessment to assessment to a lot of different audiences. I can talk about assessment for 20 minutes. I can talk about assessment for two days. It just depends on how much uh, you want to know and how much background you have. So when I said glibly that I would do this, uh, I then started getting these phone calls 
from administrators in California. And they said, well, you, you can't talk about just anything. You have to make this practical. And I wondered who they had talked to in Houston to find out what kind of talks I actually gave. And then I was told that I really couldn't talk about, uh, you know, tests that I like and don't like because a lot of the people in the audience really don't give tests. And I was told to make this really pra practical and talk about this, uh, uh, talk about assessment at the level of the classroom in a way that actually be helpful to uh, teachers. And I said, okay, I'll try. So then I said, well, what's the California Reading Advisory? And they said, well, we'll send you some material. And so the next day, this big FedEx package, it's a box actually, <laughs> shows up. And there's all this stuff in there uh, to read. They said, great, I'll read this stuff and I know exactly what I need to uh, present in California. So if I can have my first overhead. What I've done is I've, uh, and I have to confess that I enjoy picking at uh, administrators and bureaucracies and uh, things of that sort. Uh, what I've done is I've gone through and I've excerpt, excerpted some uh, phrases uh, from some of the different publications that I was uh, read. This, for example, is recommendation number two from the California Reading Advisory. And it says that schools and districts must provide every teacher with a repertoire of diagnostic tools to monitor and modify instruction continuously to ensure every child's optimal development and to identify students who need help in reading. Well, I read this and I said, gee, are we supposed to turn teachers into diagnosticians and give them uh, training and giving tests and stuff like that? Uh, I mean, I, I thought that was kind of an interesting sort of, uh, of idea. And so one of the things I did recently is uh, we have a, there's a high school that has a, trying to develop a reading program. And I took one of the uh, teachers and I taught her how to do some tests just to see if she could do that. It's actually working out quite well. She's using, actually giving tests to monitor progress uh, in this reading program in a high school in Houston. Now this is, the next uh, overhead is from the local improvement plan. You all have copies of this. Uh, standards and assessment. Use of multiple measures of reading is important, especially the use of standardized group measures to measure overall reading achievement and informal criterion reference tests to measure the achievement of component skills in reading. Well, now I'm going to have to take teachers and train them for about two years to teach them to do uh, all of this because these are really quite disparate uh, recommendations. What you do in assessment with a group test uh, is worlds different from what you might do with some sort of criterion reference test. That's one of the things I'm going to address uh, today. Then on the next uh, overhead, here's another little excerpt. The reading advisory identifies phoneme awareness, letter name recognition, phonics, spelling, vocabulary, and reading comprehension as curricular areas that merit direct teaching and therefore direct assessment. Now this is a real problem because uh, until Joe talks, we don't really have uh, tools for a lot of this type of assessment at this point of time. That's changing, but for some of these areas, that's really quite a problem. So now it's a three-year uh, training program. <laughs> Here's another uh, excerpt. Benchmark or diagnostic measures should be used in relationship to an organized curriculum for explicitly teaching component skills, and there should be evidence that results, that results will guide the placement of children in groups appropriate for their instructional level. Uh, grouping is a controversial sort of thing, but in particular, the use, use of tests to group children is very controversial. How are you going to do this? What kind of assessment uh, is it? Look at the next one. In the kindergarten, first and second grades, the focus of assessment should be on individual diagnosis rather than a group st standardized achievement test. Now that's a little bit different from the very first one uh, that I uh, read you. The next one. These diagnostic tools should be curriculum-based measures whoops, that include teacher observations and judgments as well as more formal measures of word recognition and reading comprehension. It's getting pretty complicated. And then one more. At this level, testing is concerned less with comparison and more providing accurate diagnostic information to teachers and parents about each individual child's reading progress. Well, some people would say that all, all you do with testing is you compare people. So I don't know what the difference is between comparison and individual diagnosis. I mean, some sort of comparison has to occur at some point. 
So I read all of this, and uh, I really was in quite a conundrum because I didn't really know quite what I was going to do uh, for this presentation. So I talked to Barbara and Joe, and what we decided to do is really a three-pronged uh, presentation where I'm going to talk about basic concept, concepts of assessment. And what I'm going to try and do is to e explain what underlies a lot of the concepts uh, in all these statements that I read you from the California Reading uh, Advisory materials. Now I'm going to talk about what assessment is. Uh, I'm going to talk about some very important concepts in assessment. Because the reality is that we're not going to take teachers and make them assessors, uh, or diagnosticians uh, in particular. What we can do is make them consumers of assessment devices, and there are certainly assessment devices that we can put in the hands of teachers, some of which are more formal and some of which are more informal. And I'm going to talk about three examples uh, of these types of assessments a little bit later. And then Joe and Barbara are going to come later uh, today, and they're going to talk very specifically about uh, issues that are in assessment that are related to the California Reading uh, Advisory. So let's talk about what assessment really is. Uh, I've given you some definitions uh, here. Assessment is the sampling of specific behaviors in order to make generalizations about larger classes of behaviors. Now that's my own idiosyncratic uh, definition of what assessment is. But what you want to do in assessment is you want to go and you want to take a snapshot of a child's development. If I'm in a clinic, for example, and a child comes in to see me, well, I'm not going to go, for example, necessarily out to the school and watch the kid in the, in the classroom. I mean, why should I do that? I can send the teacher something to fill out, for example, and she can share her observations uh, with me. Now, that's a kind of assessment, okay? It's a little snapshot of the teacher's experience with the child. It's not the same as the teacher's uh, ongoing interaction with the child. It's an assessment of that interaction. If I give the child a test, say I measure their reading level, for example, or try and measure the reading comprehension skills. It's a little snapshot. Okay, I'm doing an assessment, and what I'm going to do with that assessment is I'm going to make a larger set of generalizations about what I think the child should be able to do out in the real world. That's what we do in assessment. Assessments are shortcuts. They're snapshots. They're efforts to make uh, generalizations about broad classes of behaviors by narrowing in on behaviors that we think are particularly uh, important. Let me tell you some things that assessment is not. Assessment is not equivalent to certain types of tests and methods. Okay? In particular, you don't want to get into an assessment-driven, test-driven sort of method of assessment. There are a variety of different methods. There are a variety of different tests. Tests are not the be-all and end-all in assessment. A lot of it depends on what it is that you want to assess and what kinds of generalizations you want to be able to make about a child. Assessment is not equivalent to certain types of professional identities. One of the things that drives me crazy uh, in schools is going, we call them ARD committee meetings uh, in Texas. They're, they're basically special ed eligibility and planning uh, committees. It's to go in and everybody is, is sitting there represented by a particular discipline. The speech therapist is there, the educational diagnostician is there, the special ed coordinator is there, the teacher uh, is there. And the only people that are allowed to talk about assessment are the diagnosticians, and the speech therapist. And if I as a psychologist go in and I start asking questions about the speech and language test, sometimes I'm told, gee, you're not a speech and language professional. You can't ask questions about these sorts of tests. Well, I know a lot about assessment. And I know a lot about speech and language tests. I know a lot about the concepts of assessment. And assessment is not something that's test-driven, discipline-driven. Uh, it's not something that belongs to in the, per in the purview of a particular profession. Anybody that understands basic concepts of assessment, of tests, of measurement, can ask meaningful questions in a meeting like this. And that's my point. That's what I'm going to try and share with you today. The most important aspect of assessment from a measurement perspective is that assessments must be reliable and valid. They must be reliable and valid. And if you, as a teacher or an administrator, understand anything about tests, and in particular, if you want to devil somebody that gives tests, ask them what the liability is. Ask them what sort of support is there for the validity. Those are very meaningful questions. They're questions that teachers should ask. They're questions that parents uh, should ask. Because oftentimes, in educational settings, we rely on assessment methods where we don't know what the reliability is, where we haven't studied the validity, uh, where the uh, assessment device is basically anecdotal. It's kind of what I thought about the child while I was shaving in the mirror uh, this morning. That's not reliable, 
The validity is questionable. Uh, every assessor must be concerned that the assessment devices, not tests, but assessment devices, whatever it is that you use to make an assessment, a report card, a running record, a portfolio, observation of the child in the classroom, is the, is the way that you're sampling behavior reliable and valid. You need to become obsessive about that uh, issue, particularly in education. Okay, on the next overhead, what is reliability? Again, these are, these are somewhat idiosyncratic uh, definitions because I'm trying to make them practical. I can give you some really complicated definitions, but they put me to sleep, too. <laughs> now, here's a very useful definition of reliability. Reliability is the agreement between two efforts to measure the same phenomenon through maximally similar methods. The emphasis is on the word similar. If I give two different measures of reading comprehension, for example, if they're reliable, uh, they, should, they should have a pretty good correlation. If I, if I look at, look at uh, an assessment of a particular test, I give it twice, the relationship of the test on the two different occasions should be high because it has good reliability, okay? The scores are reproducible using similar kinds of methods. Measures that are reliable yield scores that are reproducible with, within subjects. In other words, if you give it to the same child twice, you get similar scores. They're reliable within observational context. Uh, if, you, if you give the child the, a, a test in a group setting, you know, if, if it's reliable, you'll get the same sort of score in a, in a individual setting. And over time, test retest. If you give the same test twice within a short period of time, you should get very similar scores. Anytime you get a score, and it doesn't matter whether it's a test on a score, uh, whether it's a miscue analysis, any, any index that you take of the child's ability to function is a, is a combination of what we might think of as systematic variation, which is a true score. It's the index of the child's actual performance and what you think of as error variation. If you give a child an IQ test and you say their IQ is 100, well, on either side of that score of 100, on most IQ tests, you have a, something called the standard error of measurement, which is seven points. Okay, that 100 actually uh, exists somewhere between 93 to 107, depending on how much error variability there is in that particular child's uh, test score. And basically, what's important is that a, a test score any, any sort of index score is unreliable if there's more error variation relative to true score variation. Uh, a very good example of this is like on a group test. You, you, you bring a classroom in, you give them uh, the Stanford Reading Achievement Test or something like that. You know, there's going to be one child who's uh, looking out the window. There's going to be another child who is uh, uh, not paying attention, is already starting to bubble in as fast as they can. Those are sources of uh, error. There are going to be children that, that didn't feel very good that morning, didn't have any breakfast. You know, those are all sources of error. And those are things that can contaminate the reliability uh, of a test. What's important is to ask questions about reliability, to know something about the reliability of a test or a measurement device that you're using. A big problem, for example, with observational methods re revolves around reliability. Observational methods, portfolios, miscue analysis, things of this sort, uh, have very good val validity if they're reliable. And the issue with any, anything that's really observationally based is always the reliability of the assessment. We're going to talk about ways to enhance that a little bit later. Okay, the next one. Let's talk about the relationship of reliability and validity. And this is, very, th this is, this is uh, measurement 101 in graduate school. It's the first thing, first thing we're taught, you know, in PhD school. Validity can be no stronger than reliability. If it's not reliable, it's not valid, period. You can have tests that are reliable, but they don't have any validity. For example, uh, I, can, I can develop a test of reading, for example, that's uh, very reliable, has good reproducibility, but it has no relationship to things that the child actually has to learn or to some skill that's viewed as uh, important, then it's not valid. It's just not useful, okay? Tests can never be valid and unreliable. There is no such thing as an unreliable, valid test. Uh, if you read uh, and somebody says, well, the, the reliability isn't that good, but it's really useful to me, that's bull. <laughs> you know, that's anecdote. 
That's, that's no better than uh, waking up in the mirror and shaving and thinking about what you're going to say at the uh, committee meeting for the trial that day. It's not reliable. Therefore, it's not valid. Therefore, nobody has any business saying anything about the trial based on the device. Now let's talk about validity. Now validity, I've written the same sort of sentence here that I wrote for reliability. reliability. Validity is the agreement between two attempts to measure the same phenomenon through maximally different methods. Notice when I said reliability, I said similar methods. Well, now I'm talking about validity as being different. What you want to do, for example, is to take different sets of, of reading tests. And if they're valid, there'll be some core agreement. They're actually statistical methods to get at what that core uh, really is. But if you have a number of measures of word decoding skills and you use the wide range achievement test and the Woodcock-Johnson achievement test and you take you know, all, the all the measures of single word uh, decoding, they should be very highly correlated. Uh, first of all, they're all very reliable, these types of measures. Uh, they should be very highly correlated, and in fact they are. And what that tells you is that these are all valid methods of assessing word decoding ability. Measures that are valid yield scores that are related across subjects, observational context, and time. They predict something. They tell you, about some tell you something about the child uh, in the future. There are really different kinds of validity. We have predictive validity. Predictive validity is the relationship of a measure with a criterion that's administered subsequently. A very good example of predictive validity is the ability to recognize numbers and letters in kindergarten. That has a very robust, a very predictive relationship with reading skills in the second grade. That's an example of predictive validity. There are many other examples uh, of this. Now one of the things that people do is they confuse predictive validity where there's an interval of time separating the, the two different assessments, the predictor and the criterion, from concurrent validity, which is the relationship of a measure with a simultaneously obtained criterion. For example, concurrent validity would be the relationship of a miscue analysis or a running record or something like that with a norm reference uh, test. You know, both measures are reliable. Uh, if the observational measure was reliably obtained, uh, it should have a reasonable relationship with the norm reference test of reading. Now that is not predictive validity, that's concurrent validity. Because neither measure in and of themselves may predict some future attribute, the child's future ability uh, to perform. They're different kinds of validity. Okay, on the next overhead, you have more examples of validity. We have content validity. Content validity is the relationship of the items used to measure phenomenon with a larger class of phenomenon. I mean, what's reading? Okay, to read, you have to look at single words, you have to read sentences. Uh, those are all examples of content validity. Observational measures, for example, have great content validity. They represent actual indices of the child's performance in the classroom. They have very good face validity. What that doesn't mean is that they have construct validity. Down below, number four. Construct validity is the relationship of a measure with the underlying attribute it purports to measure. Anytime we give a test, anytime we go out and measure something, what we're measuring is a latent variable. You can think about it as ph phonological awareness, for example. Well, all the methods that we use to measure phonological awareness uh, have measurement error associated with it. If all of these different tests we might use are examples of measures of phonological awareness, they should, they should be able to identify this latent variable. It goes back to that concept of reliability. You know, this is tied directly to issues of reliability of measure. What we often don't do is to attend to the construct validity of the test that we're using. This is the biggest weakness of tests and measurement is the absence of attention to construct validity. Uh, many people, for example, say that they have a test that measures reading comprehension. Well, reading comprehension is really very difficult uh, to measure. Sometimes I think that's like measuring attentional skills in children. Uh, the child's attention in my office may be radically different from the child's attention in the classroom. A child's reading comprehension may be very different in my office, for example, than it is out in the classroom. And one of the things I always do is talk to teachers. I want them to tell me what the child's reading comprehension is like. Uh, so measures of reading comprehension, for example, may not have particularly good construct validity. It's not assessed enough. 
The bottom line is that tests and observations measure indicators of underlying attributes with varying degrees of precision. And what you do when you assess construct validity is you try and figure that out. Any test should be able to show demonstrable predictive validity, content validity, concurrent validity, and construct validity. Those are questions that you, as consumers of tests or measurements, should ask about. Okay, let's talk about types of tests. One of the things that, and I, I deliberately set it up so it would be confusing, one of the, reason that the, re, one of the reasons that the uh, material I showed you at the very beginning, the excerpt from the California Reading Advisory, looks confusing, uh, is that uh, they're talking about different kinds of tests. Okay? They're talking about norm reference tests and criterion reference tests. And these are different, very different sorts of tests. In a norm reference test, the, perform, the performance of a child is compared to the performance of other children at the same age or grade. Okay, everybody knows what a norm reference test is. You know, they're, they're individually administered, they're group uh, administered. Uh, nobody works in schools without some, without some exposure to these types of devices. Norm reference tests yield scores that represent the child's rank in the comparison population. They're ways of ranking children. Okay, they are independent of the content of instruction. Uh, nobody really teaches to the content of a norm reference test, uh, and if you do, uh, you completely violate the purpose. One of the things that happens in uh, Houston is that uh, we have uh, schools that you can qualify if your score on norm reference tests uh, is at a certain level, and one of the problems that we have uh, is that parents try and access these norm reference tests so they can teach them to the child. That'll get, that's guaranteed to get you into a program. And as a psychologist, one of the things that we're hampered, we're, we're, that's hammered to us all the time is to protect the content of norm reference tests for exactly that purpose. We want to keep them independent of the content of instruction. We want to avoid teaching to the test. Now, one of the problems with norm reference tests is that they may not be sensitive to change. I have to emphasize that. If somebody wants to go in and they want to monitor classroom progress or how rapidly a child is developing during the year, one of the poorest ways to do that is to administer norm reference tests on a successive basis. Okay, the reason is that the metrics that you, that you generate out of a norm reference test don't do anything other than rank children relative to other children of the same age, for example. Most norm reference tests, for example, uh, group children together in four-month bands, six-month bands, year bands. Okay? Well, percentiles or standard scores tell you only about the child's uh, rank in the population. They don't tell you anything about how the child is moving within the population. They're very indirect indices of that. They, they often, uh, the, the cohorts, the groups of kids that you compare to are basically what I would call cross-sexual. It's not the cha same child being assessed over time to develop the norms. We have no tests, for example, that have longitudinal norms that talk about how much progress a child uh, should make. We have the ability to develop those sorts of tests, and, and Dr. Foreman's going to talk about that uh, later. But all that happens if you test a child, for example, within the year, over a two-year period with a norm reference test, is you're simply seeing where they change or don't change within this cross-sectional cohort. It doesn't tell you anything about rate of growth, how fast they're developing, uh, or anything like that. And I think later you'll see good examples of why this type of assessment is particularly uh, critical. It doesn't tell you much about change over time. Okay, let's talk about criterion reference tests. Criterion reference tests uh, are, are basically performance measures that are compared to standards that are deemed appropriate for a child relative to mastery of an area. They are directly linked to the curriculum. They are directly linked to instruction. Criterion reference tests yield scores that represent the amount of material that's mastered, they're often not standardized, but they can be. And they're closely linked to the content of instruction. The, the problem with, with, with criterion reference tests, of course, is that they're not norm referenced. Uh, anytime you do criterion reference tests, you have to supplement them with some sort of norm reference test because criterion reference test, testing tells you nothing about generalization. It does not tell you what types of skills the child is taking when they leave the classroom. Have they really learned to decode? Do they really have good reading comprehension skills? And you can very commonly see children that do well on criterion reference tests, but then the teacher next year says, well, gee, you know, he, he did so well on these measures, but he doesn't seem to know how to decode, for example. And that's because you really need both types of assessment. 
Criterion reference tests are basically tests that you teach to. There's not necessarily any generalization to an ability or to a skill. And then the finally t final type of test, it's really better to think about this as an observational measure, or, or, or observational uh, measures, where performance is based on informal methods of assessment and the documentation of behavior in context. Running records, portfolios, miscue analysis, uh, these are all examples of observational uh, methods. And I'm going to talk in more detail about these types of methods, but I will reiterate what I said earlier. Uh, they have great validity if they're reliable, and reliability uh, is really the key issue for any sort of observational measure uh, of a child's performance in classroom. Now let's talk about different types of assessments. I'm going to talk, I'm going to, there, you can really take this sort of trichotomy that I've developed here and really <coughs> subdivide it and redivide it and, I mean, it multiplies in and of itself. You know, there are all kinds of names for assessment devices. But in my opinion, there, there are really three approaches that people use to assess uh, children. There are skill-based assessments. And I think uh, Dr. Torgerson and Dr. Foreman will both talk about uh, these types of assessments in their talk today. There are curriculum-based assessments, which I'm going to emphasize uh, a little bit uh, later as an alternative to both criterion reference and observational sorts of measures. And then there are process-oriented assessments, which are very uh, much oriented to observation in context. Let's look at skill-based assessments first. Skill-based assessments focus on the use of tests to measure reading and spelling skills and skills that underlie reading and spelling. In most skill-based assessments, there's going to be some sort of direct assessment of reading and spelling. I'm going to talk specifically only about reading and spelling at this point from now on. Uh, but using a skill-based assessment, you try and assess skills and abilities that you think underlie success for, in reading and spelling. That will change depending on the age. In, in kindergarten, for example, uh, letter names and sounds can be very important. Uh, as a child gets older, you want to ass directly assess phonological awareness skills, vocabulary, uh, things of that sort. Uh, these types of measures are usually norm referenced. Uh, they can be very sensitive to change if they're designed in a way that allows for the measurement of growth. And you'll hear examples of that uh, later on. And they must be supplemented by norm referenced uh, tests. And what I mean by that is that uh, these types of measures are very useful, but they tend to be ability-oriented. And what you want is really well-standardized, a highly reliable assessment of specific kinds of reading and spelling skills to supplement this type of ability testing. The sensitivity to change depends very much on how the test is constructed. Uh, if it's only norm reference, it's not sensitive to change, or not as sensitive as you would like it to be. To assess change with a skill-based assessment, you need instruments that have lots of items. You need lots of items to show change. The metrics themselves have to be performance-based, some index of what the child is actually doing and how they're actually changing, things like uh, how, how fast they read per minute, the size of their reading vocabulary, the number of words they can read on a list, for example. If you have enough items, it'll be very sensitive to change. And on this overhead uh, is an example of a skill-based assessment that we use in our research uh, where at different ages uh, we emphasize the assessment of different kinds of skills, uh, letter names and sounds in kindergarten, uh, vocabulary in kindergarten, grade one and grade two, naming skills, phonological awareness skills across the board, uh, perceptual motor skills. Uh, at the bottom you see measures of spelling and word reading, but as Barbara will show you uh, later, these are not, for example, standardized tests of reading and spelling. They're wordless that have lots of items on them. And the child reads them several times, is exposed to this list several times during the year. The key, of course, is to keep the, uh, name, the words away from parents and so on so they won't teach the words to the child because then it turns only into a criterion reference assessment. Now, let's look at the next overhead. Most people who, who use... Uh, who use uh, skill-based assessments employ some type of individually administered achievement battery. And there's a lot of reference to these sorts of achievement batteries in the California Reading uh, Advisory. So what I did for fun while I was shaving is to think of all the different achievement batteries <laughs> that I actually use myself. And uh, I thought of seven just off the top of my head. The, uh, these are all well-known uh, 
virtually everybody's had some sort of exposure uh, to them. Uh, I'm not going to go through and read all these different tests. Uh, the, what I would emphasize is that these tests are not the same. They each have different subtests. They measure reading and spelling in different sorts of ways. What they have in common is that every single one of these, except for number six, has a child we read a word list. Beyond that, they, they, they assess reading and spelling skills in very different ways. For example, the Woodcock-Johnson Psychoeducational Test Battery and the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test assess reading comprehension by having a child read a sentence and fill in a missing word. On the uh, Peabody Individual Achievement Test, you read a paragraph, a sentence or a paragraph, and you point to a picture. On the Gray Oral Reading Test, you, um, you read uh, a passage out loud, and then you answer questions about it. Okay, the nice, what's nice is that these are all reasonable measures of reading comprehension. Uh, they will vary in an individual child depending on a lot of different factors that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. But because they're reliable, if you take all these different measures and you correlate them, they'll all show relationships. They do measure reading comprehension, they, they just do it in very different uh, ways. The same thing is true for spelling uh, and so on. Uh, these measures basically have strengths and weaknesses depending on content. They do vary uh, to a certain extent in their psychometric properties. And I deliberately, for example, put the Woodcock tests uh, at the top uh, because traditionally they've always had very good uh, examples of reliability and validity. These are psychometrically very good uh, measures. Uh, another thing to think about any type of skill-based assessment, this is very important for administrators to understand. Uh, individually administered achievement batteries say a lot about a person. They're very useful for an individual child. They say nothing about a teacher, a school, a curriculum, or anything like that. It is strictly person-level information. Don't generalize from the performance of children on individually administered achievement tests and make statements about the school or the teacher or anything like that. These are statements only about the child. In contrast, let's look at some group-based uh, achievement tests. And the comment that I like to make about group-based achievement tests is that they're better than nothing. <laughs> the problem with them, and I, 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 here's some names. The, the problems with them uh, is that you really can't control what the child does when they take these tests. It just drives me nuts. Uh, you know, try, somebody comes in and they say, oh my gosh, they only scored the 30th percentile on the Iowa test. And so I give them a Woodcock Johnson, and I say, well, geez, he's got reading skills that are at the 90th percentile. I don't, I don't get this. Uh, well, what happened is the child wasn't paying attention, didn't eat breakfast, uh, didn't bubble in right, you know, something like that. What's important about group-based tests is that they say nothing about a person. You should never really take a child's individual test score and make a generalization about that child. What they say a lot about are groups. Uh, Group-based tests are very reasonable in terms of looking at how school is doing, at how well a curriculum is doing. Uh, they are mac they're, they're, they're for big groups of people. That's what they're designed for. They're designed to go in and test a lot of people. An advantage of testing a lot of people is all this kind of uh, error variability that affects an individual child washes out if you test groups of kids because you've got all the other kids that you know, are cheating you know, or something like that who have inflated test scores and it averages out you know, in the end. Group-based tests, because they don't uh, talk about individuals, don't help teachers very much. They tell you a lot about the school. They tell you a lot about the state. Uh, we have, for example, a criterion reference uh, measure in Texas called the Texas Assessment of Academic Skills, the TOS test. It's an exit uh, exam. You have to pass it. Your appropriations are dependent in part on how you do uh, with it. And the the complaint that I make very commonly and the statement that I make about TOS test scores very commonly is that they are great uh, as long as you understand that all you're doing is evaluating how the state is doing. They don't say anything about a teacher, about a curriculum or anything like that. They tell you how the state is doing and it's nothing more than accountability at the level of a very large group. It has nothing to do with individual accountability. It tells you how schools are doing, doesn't tell you how kids are doing. Okay. And that, let's talk a little bit about curriculum-based assessment. Now, I actually like curriculum-based assessment. I think, I think these types of methods have great uh, promise, uh, partly because they are designed to be put in the hands of teachers. 
Curriculum-based assessments are, are criterion refer reference methods. They are tied to a curriculum, but they usually have some type, they can have some type of normative basis. Some of the better examples of, of curriculum-based assessments actually have norms. The goal of a curriculum-based assessment is to map the assessment onto the curriculum in order to identify instructional needs and mastery. They can be informal, but the trend is towards more precision and formality. They're becoming increasingly uh, well-developed. A lot of the applications now, for example, involve probe assessments of a child's functioning. The teacher goes in, they spend five minutes with the child on a particular task that's directly linked to the curriculum. Uh, the teacher then enters this information into a computer, and the computer uh, then graphs the child's progress over time, and decisions are made based on the rate of change in, during the year in the classroom relative to the curriculum objectives. Some of this stuff is really very nifty. So on the next overhead, here's some of the advantages. Curriculum-based assessments are administered in the classroom, often by the teacher, using items and materials from the curriculum. Assessment is ongoing, frequent, and continuous. Mastery can be relative to a curriculum or to a normative basis, and they are very sensitive by definition to change. That's one of the real strengths. Some of the things that we know about using these types of methods is that when teachers have this type of information, they respond to direct feedback about progress. They raise their goals and expectations, and they modify at the level of the individual. That is very positive. This is the type of assessment that teachers can actually uh, administer and use. The weakness of curriculum-based assessment is the issue of transfer. In the absence of some sort of skills-based assessment, you don't know how well these types of skills are actually transferring into the child's ability repertoire. They are dependent on what you teach and what you, what you measure. Uh, and if your curriculum's not any good, it doesn't do any good to teach to it. <laughs> Curriculum-based assessments <laughs> in that kind of context aren't very meaningful either. So, you know, really, in fact, a lot of people talk about uh, combining methods from skill-based assessments with curriculum-based assessments, which I think is actually very useful. Now, one of the things that I think is interesting on the next overhead, if, if you look at curriculum-based assessment really began to develop with a big emphasis on miscue analysis, portfolios, uh, things of this sort. But the research on these methods, and I would emphasize research, this is good research, uh, shows that really three measures account for most of the variance in skill development and mastery of the curriculum in children. For example, reading aloud for passages scored as the number of words correctly read per minute. That's basically a decoding kind of measure. So measure reading fluency. People that don't do well on this usually don't have good decoding uh, skills. Uh, and that, this is something that teachers can do frequently, continuously, put into a computer and chart growth. The best measure of comprehension is the ability to provide single words to fill in blanks and passages. It's called a closed task. And it's scored as the number of correct restorations every 2.5 minutes. What you're doing is you're taking an individual child in the classroom, you're doing these two measures uh, with them, you take the information, you enter it to in the computer, and then you chart the child's growth. These are two very good indicates of growth and reading skills over a school year. And they're much simpler than portfolio analysis or miscue analysis or things like that. And then spelling. Uh, there's a weekly dictated spelling list uh, that's done every week, uh, and the score is a number correct in two minutes, enter it to in the computer, you can plot how well the child's spelling skills or develop, develop. Now an important aspect of curriculum-based assessment is that it incorporates observations of a child's reading and spelling. You listen to the child read on a continuous sort of basis. There are ways of incorporating that information, but change is measured really with these types of devices. Okay, and then the final type of assessment I'm going to talk about is, is really process-oriented assessment. There is a rich history of process-oriented assessments uh, in all areas of measurement. And people that do process-oriented assessments, unfortunately, uh, tend to be antagonistic. They tend to be the types of people who go around saying things like norm reference tests aren't any good, and I don't believe in abilities, and the most important thing to do is to watch how a child uh, does it. Uh, how they do it is more important than the product. The reality is, is that it's like everything else. There's truth, there's truth in everything, and the, the key is to avoid sort of dichotomizing or trichotomizing or taking strong positions on anything and, th and, and incorporating the strengths of these different approaches. 
And the strengths of process-oriented assessments is that the assessment is based on observations of the child's actual reading and spelling ability. You watch them do it. You make notes. The measures tend to be informal, which can be a strength and a weakness, and they tend not to be specific. Uh, they're not necessarily standardized across different kinds of contexts. That immediately raises the specter of reliability. They must be supplemented by norm reference testing. Anybody who's really serious about process-oriented assessment always has that as a qualification. Must be supplemented by norm reference testing. The big issue is reliability. Uh, you must avoid anecdotal descriptions of the child's uh, reading behavior because it may not be reliable and it may not be useful. And it's of no use at all to groups. Uh, it, tell, it is very much person-specific. There's no way to aggregate across uh, cases. Uh, it doesn't tell you sort of how good a curriculum is, uh, how well it's being implemented. It only gives you person-level uh, information. Now to wrap this up, let's just talk about some of the things that people that use process assessment do when they look at uh, reading and spelling. For example, I'm gonna, if you look at the assessment of decoding skills, there's six things that you can look at if you want to use observational process-based uh, measures. For example, how effectively does a child focus on the details of the word? Is this a child, for example, who looks at the first letter and then guesses? Uh, do they get the, the first syllable and then uh, ignore the rest? Uh, uh, are, they, are, they, are they strictly guess readers? Do they read in context and so on? Does the child have sufficient knowledge of letter names, sounds, and combinations? This is something that you can tell just by listening to a child read. You can chart their errors and things of that sort. Often will tell you what, what aspects uh, of their phonological language skills need to be taught. Can the child break down and put together sounds in the correct order? Something to ask, to listen to when, you, when, when they read. The next one. Number four is really the key. How efficient or fast is the child at analyzing single words? Kids that are good decoders look at a word and they know what it is immediately. There's no gap. They don't sit and stumble, you know, or anything like that. And it's very common, for example, to give norm reference tests, identify children with large reading vocabularies, or spell, uh, spelling is less so, but identify large reading vocabularies, and then realize that their word analysis skills are actually very poor, so that their comprehension is actually impaired because they're not very efficient at breaking down words. If they come across a word they haven't memorized, everything breaks down. So that's the next question, are the child's word analysis skills at age and grade level? Do they do it as well as their peers? And then the last, how large is the child's reading vocabulary? How many words do they know on site? Word analysis, the most important thing that you do when you make a process analysis of word decoding skills is to separate word analysis from vocabulary skills. How many words can the child look at and say? And how efficient are they at analyzing words that they don't know or, or should know? Those are four and six are the most important things to pay attention to. Now, a lot of people like to assess reading comprehension skills using process or observational kinds of approaches. I will warn you that reading comprehension is a very complex process. Assessment is confounded by many variables. The most important, quite frankly, is the adequacy of decoding skills. Uh, but factors such as attention, memory, oral language skills, factual knowledge, organizational skills, context, motivation, will all influence uh, any kind of assessment or reading comprehension skills. And one of the things that anybody that does assessment has to do when they're assessing reading comprehension skills is make some attempt to break out all these factors. And it's hard to do. I don't have any magic uh, for you other than years of experience. Well, these are some of the things that children need to be able to do when they assess reading comprehension. They need to be able to interpret information not only at the level of a paragraph or at a text, but at the level of the sentence. Can they take a sentence and understand what the sentence is about? They need to be able to identify main ideas. They need to be able to identify supporting ideas. What's the evidence for the main idea? They need to ignore or reject information that's irrelevant. A lot of times, particularly with young children, they'll read, you ask them what the story's about, and they'll tell you something that's not even related to the main idea. Okay, they need to be taught to do that. And then they need to make inferences or conclusions. They need to be, they need to be able to go beyond the concrete information that's in the uh, text. And the next over here, here's some useful ways at, uh, at getting at that. Very simple, just four, four ideas for informal assessments or reading comprehension. Have the child read a sentence. Don't make them read the book, 
the paragraph. See, what, see, if it, see why it breaks down at the level of the sentence. And then answer a question about the sentence. If you look at things at the level of the sentence, you get a very good sense of whether they're paying attention. You know, is a problem with text reading, for example, one that, that they're not paying attention, that they don't like to read. If you do it sentence by sentence, you get a much better sense of what their decoding skills are like. You get a much better sense of, of what types of conclusions uh, they can reach. You get a good idea about what they can understand about concrete information. You don't get much of an idea about inferencing or, any, or main ideas or anything like that, but at least you begin to break down some of these nonspecific factors that are not related to reading comprehension. A second phenomenon, it is very common to assess reading comprehension with oral reading. Some kids don't read well out loud. Have the child read the material silently and answer questions. That's very important. If, if the child is stumbling around words, they're very disfluent, uh, kids in particular that are weak in attention or memory skills are not good oral readers, but they don't really have comprehension problems if you don't make them read out loud. It's a very important assessment. Have the child retell the passage in their own words. Now what that tells you actually is a lot about the child's discourse ability. Children who don't have good discourse skills are usually not good reading comprehenders. Uh, if they can't tell the story accurately, it means that they probably don't have the ability to formulate uh, much less abstract uh, information from text or from oral language, for that matter. And then the fourth is to make your questions specific. Don't, make, don't just ask general inferencing sorts of information. Ask some questions about facts. Ask some questions about main ideas. Ask some questions that are about inferences. Make it a broad assessment. And then finally, a couple of words about spelling. Six little things to look for when you're doing a qualitative analysis of a child's spelling skills. Can the reader determine the word the child is attempting to spell? By definition, a spelling disability is you can't read what the child wrote. Are the misspellings phonetically accurate or inaccurate? That tells you a lot. If there's a single thing that you look at when you do spelling skills, it's whether the child is capable of phonetically re-representing the word. If, they're, if, if the spelling errors are phonetically inaccurate, then they probably have phonics based deficits, phonological awareness problems, and so on. If they're phonetically accurate, but orthographically inaccurate, uh, then there are a whole host of factors that may be going on. One of the most common, for example, uh, in a child that can spell phonetically, but uh, doesn't, still doesn't get the word right, is that they haven't had enough practice with it, or they have motor problems. They're just very clumsy and very, not very good at writing, and so everything breaks down because of the mechanical act of writing. They can tell, tell you how to spell the word, but they can't write it. Is the error pattern consistent? In, in other words, how well consolidated are their skills? Are the letters in the right order? Does the spelling follow orthographic conventions? For four and five, uh, these are things that have to be taught explicitly. You have to teach the child the exceptions. The child's not going to figure them out. You have to learn all these funny little rules, you know, like I, I before E except after C, and so on. And then the one of the ones that's my favorite is, can the child spell words in isolation but not in context? I just love this one. Uh, you get these kids that come in and they have great spelling uh, grades and you know, what they do is they study, study, study their spelling tests. They uh, memorize the spelling words. They, they, they get 100 every spelling test. But then uh, next week uh, you come in and you look at this essay and they can't spell anything. You often see that in kids that don't pay attention very well that have motor problems, what happens is that uh, their working memory gets overloaded and what always goes is the spelling. Uh, it's a very interesting sort of issue. Now these observational methods are very useful. As I said, the issue is basically twofold. One is reliability and then second is what the heck do you do with all the information that you get. How do you aggravate it? Aggra aggravate is a good word. How do you aggravate it? How do you aggregate it? What are you going to tell people about the information that you got? And it's never really meaningful in the absence of other forms of assessments. So here's, here's where I want to wrap up. This is, this is the take home message. Any assessment must specify reliability and validity. Everybody needs to be obsessive about that. Don't let somebody come in your classroom and tell you that this is what you need to do without asking them, well, what's the reliability and the validity? If I were a teacher, I'd bug people to death with that question. All these different approaches to assessment are really more similar than different. If I assess a child, for example, uh, I do ability-based tests, I, watch a I listen to a child read, for example, 
Uh, I'm interested in what kinds of curriculum information, what, what, what the curriculum is. I, I evaluate all those sorts of things. And we really need to get better at incorporating information from different kinds of assessments. They all have good information. There's truth in everything. Assessments must be put in the hands of teachers. And what I mean by that, I don't mean that the teacher has to do the assessment. I mean that the assessment information has to be meaningful to the teacher. We go out in schools and do testing all the time, and it's just useless because the teacher doesn't know what to do with it. I once did a program where we uh, did kindergarten screening for 15,000 children in uh, Houston. And we generated 15,000 computer-based reports. And I am certain that 14,960 ended up in the garbage can <laughs> because it meant nothing. It didn't tell a teacher anything about what they needed to be doing uh, with the child. Who cared how well they could copy geometric designs, for example? I mean, what does that have to do with the curriculum in kindergarten? Teachers must attend to strengths and weaknesses of the various approaches to assessment. Assessment must relate both to normative indices of mastery and classroom-based indices of mastery. And the only, the only reason that the, Calif the material I showed you from the California Reading Advisory uh, may seem confusing is that's what they're saying. They're saying that we need different ways of assessing children. Some of it needs to be normative-based. Some of it needs to be classroom-based. All of it's important. I believe in assessment. I think it's extremely useful. I think it's also very useful when it's put in the hands of teachers. Thank you.